In 1958, William Willie Higginbotham, who had worked on the first atomic bomb, turned two rudimentary lines and a bouncing ball into the first interactive entertainment experience on a computer, Tennis for Two. Every weekend they would have these contests to see who could come up with the coolest thing. Yeah, Willie Higginbotham came up with this idea that you could take an oscilloscope and make a tennis game out of it. It was an expression of a kind of rebellious adolescent energy working alongside the military projects, taking this most expensive piece of equipment at the time and repurposing it to play games. Suddenly, computers had a use beyond military computations. But as the war evolved, so would the games and the players. Laika, first space traveler, was ready for the takeoff. And here it is. And I do remember all this noise about the, the dogs coming in the, in the, in the space. I, I even remember their names, you know. <laughs> Bielka and Strelka and whatever, you know. <laughs> Shortly after Laika's flight, the Russian Man in Space program began. The same centrifuge that tested Laika was now adapted for human experiments. Definitely Gagarin's flight w w was a very big deal in 61. Major Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin was launched into orbit around the Earth. Yuri Gagarin had taken the first steps into outer space for the USSR, but America wasn't far behind. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The Cold War became a race to space. The space age. And it deeply influenced Steve Russell, an MIT programmer who carried video games into the next realm with his own virtual space war. Space race was in the, very much in the news. And, uh, you know, spaceships taking off, spaceships blowing up uh, were something that you could hardly escape. And further, I had just read Doc Smith's Lesman series. These are a bunch of science fiction stories where the, uh, the heroes went zooming across the galaxy, inventing new technology as they went, being pursued by the forces of pure evil. Before he could battle the forces of pure evil, Steve Slug Russell had to master the hulking PDP-1 campus computer. This is a PDP-1. The first computer I met, like, that, like a modern personal computer, you can turn it on with one switch. It was considered at the time a microcomputer, meaning it was only the size of a refrigerator. It cost $120,000, and it did something simple like typing or uh, being a desk calculator. The programs were typically called expensive, so there was expensive typewriter and expensive desk calculator. It didn't show anything spectacular. It was so unimpressive that they kind of felt like, no way, we can do, with this PDP, we can do something way cooler. Eventually, we figured out that, well, you could have two spaceships and they could fire torpedoes at each other. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's kind of boring. Can you make something blow up? Yeah. If Tennis for Two was a light-hearted Cold War distraction, Steve Slug Russell's game was a direct expression of the space race and the global fear of space war. That was straight out of the times. That was, you know, that was that feeling of the, the Soviet paranoia, you know, communism's gonna kick our ass. I mean, that played right into the, the collective consciousness of, the, of society. It says, we're kind of afraid here, you know, are we gonna go to war? It was truly remarkable and, a, and ahead of its time, and it was profoundly influential on me. I think it was the world's most popular computer game for a couple of years, mostly because it was the only one. The coding instructions for the game were passed from programmer to programmer, and any institution with a PDP-1 computer inevitably had a version of Space War also. So it became open source, and we gave copies of the sources to anybody who looked and anyone who wanted them. These were young guys in their 20s who were part of a group that you, we think of today as the first generation of hackers. It wasn't so much rebellion as exploration. You know, there were all these new things to do and see. Sort of joy of a uh, bright, shiny new erector set with lots of different new parts. And you can build things. One of the things Steve Russell built was the foundation for what would become the most important part of any video game experience, the joystick. Originally, the controls were just from the console switches. And uh, then some of the Model Railroad Club guys built a control box using surplus telephone parts. Steve Russell was also the first programmer to put destruction on the screen. 
Well, one thing that I sometimes say is, I unleashed the curse of video games upon the world.